have a ten dollar bill here. Borrowed from my daughter because I forgot to get a Mac this morning. <laughs> what am I about to do, sweetie? I apologize and if you want a new one, I'll get you a new one. Anyway, this is a ten dollar bill. It is a ten dollar bill. It's spendable in most places. It doesn't buy much anymore, but it's still a ten dollar bill. But if I crumple it up like this, throw it on the ground, and stop on it, it's still a ten dollar bill. It didn't change its identity. Truth doesn't change absolutes just because the lost world and college presidents and university professors say there is no truth and it's all right and everybody has his own way doesn't change the fact there is a moral law. In the letters from Birmingham, I really suggest that you read the letters from Birmingham that Dr. King wrote. Chuck Colson referred to it. Chuck Colson, as we saw last week, one of the greatest travesties of life he said he committed. He was this man who was a, a lawyer for President Nixon. He was one of six men in the Oval Office when President Nixon suggested, let's bug the Democratic National Headquarters. Let's hire people and break in. And he had the opportunity to stand up before the President of the United States and say, Mr. President, there are consequences to that decision. And he failed to open his mouth. What if he did? What if that very moment he practiced integrity? That man went on to say, he said, you know, I'm a lawyer. I'm a Harvard lawyer. He said, actually, I'm a pretty good lawyer. He said, the greatest piece on personal liberty, on moral law, ever written, was not written by a lawyer. He said the most profound document ever written was written from a Birmingham jail on the back of toilet paper by a non-lawyer by the name of Dr. Martin Luther King, who was in jail because he believed in God that there was a moral law, an absolute law, and that the only way to break an injustice law was to stand up to the injustice law and to break that law and to suffer the consequences for the law. That led him to be killed. That led to the civil rights movement in America. It was all based on the premise of the book of, 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 of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, all men are created equal in God's sight. The ground of the cross is level. Absolutely. All of us can come freely and accept the truth. But here's the thing. <clears throat> we live in a world where there is moral relativism. And we have people that believe in absolutism. But here's the problem. Most of us practice compartmentalizationism. We compartmentalize our living. Oh, at church we're moral. We're upright. We believe God. At work we might be just a wee bit different. When we're with our friends, stealing tunes, downloading off the internet, it's more relativism. I'm okay, you're okay. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, I won't tell. As I shared last week, I was a corporate exec at one time, and I was standing in a room with a, a bunch of whiz -bang guys, most of which were believers from some pretty amazing churches, who, by the way, were sitting and talking about NAFTA. How do we build factories in Mexico? Oh, by the way, the only way you can really get the job done is take a whole ton of money with you and spread it around and graft. And I'm sitting in the room as a young executive going, wait a minute, that's immoral. No, in that culture, that's what's right. And we compartmentalize our truth and what we believe and our practices. We live in a postmodern world, and that's considered normal. But there's still truth, and what do we do with it? There's a great movie that I love. Anybody love City Slickers? One of the greatest movies of all. I love Billy Crystal. I love Billy Crystal for a lot of cool yeah. ways. Do you know Billy Crystal's dad was Louis Armstrong's agent? And he grew up in a house where Duke Ellington, all these great jazz guys would come on like Tuesday night for burgers and hang out at his house. And he got to hang out with all the, anyway, that's a, that's a rabbit trail. Sorry about that. <clears throat> anyway, 
In the movie, Billy Crystal plays a guy named Mitch Robbins, a man reaching middle age, hello, plunging into his midlife crisis, been there, uh, feels that his life is falling apart, yeah, I've been there. His job has become boring and meaningless. He sees no purpose in anything he does. And this is beginning to erode all of his relationships, his family, his kids, everything. He was saved by his very intelligent wife. I'm not worthy. <laughs> it's amazing how much smarter our wives are than this. They know how to fix us sometimes. Well, his wife booked him and his buddies into a dude ranch for a cattle drive. <sighs> he meets Curly. One of the greatest characters I've ever seen. Curly recognizes from the get-go that this dude is struggling. He's got some emotional issues. He got, he's at a crisis. Curly tells him the secret to life. It's one thing. Mitch goes, what do you mean it's one thing? Curly goes, it's one thing. Well, what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. So Mitch goes through all this stuff. And at the end of this cattle drive, by seeing it to completion through incredibly awful circumstances, he discovers what this one thing is. He turns to his compadres and says, I've got it. I found what this is. And his friends are saying, hey, what is it? Well, it's different for all of us. You've got to go figure it out. You'll know it when you see it. That's the postmodern answer to the purpose of life. The one thing in your life is whatever you choose to make it. I said this last week, and I, I, I said it in a, in a group I spoke to recently, that if you talk to the average young person at college and ask them what ethics is, they will say whatever is right in your own eyes and your own personal values. Well, what are you basing it on? I'm basing it on my own personal experiences and feelings. Well, if that's the case, how do you have an absolute? What, do you, what is your anchor? With no real absolutes to guide people, there is an incessant groping about for something that has real meaning. It means that we look for what's right in our own eyes. I'll give you a verse. This is where we get back into the Bible now. John 14, 6 says this, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now there's a premise here. I want you to hear this. Either Jesus was exactly who he said he was, the Son of God, the Messiah, the solution, the truth of all mankind, or he was the greatest far-odd liar, charlatan of all times. He's either an absolute liar or he's absolute truth. There is no gray area, there's no well, maybe. He's either what exactly who he said he was, or he's a fraud. There's no if, and or but there. It's either one or the other. You choose. True. What's this one thing? If you look at the Word of God, if this is truly has the answer, what's the one thing? Barna who from time to time actually does a survey that doesn't make me angry and want to throw a book across the room, interviewed not people who weren't in church, but church people. So I'm going to give you three points about what church people think this is. The Bible's a rule book. Number one answer. It's a rule book. Well, if it's only a rule book, and everybody has a rule book, and the Muslims have a rule book, and the, and the Hindus have a rule book, which rule book is right? Well, it goes on to say this. The one thing the Bible gives is a set of rules to live by, to improve our lives. Indeed, the Bible does present us with excellent rules. It provides instruction for right living and avoiding pitfalls. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out of God, and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training, and righteousness. Yet, with all this instruction and guidance, we can learn from the Bible. Setting rules is not this. It's not the one thing. Number two answer. Typical Baptist evangelical answer. 
It provides a roadmap to heaven. Praise God. It's not the one thing. Ooh. Christians see the Bible as the primary purpose of religion and the goal of Christians of getting to heaven. Indeed, the Bible shows us a way to heaven. Peter says in John 6.68, Your words give eternal life. The Bible conveys the words of Jesus Christ that point us to heaven. But while the Bible is both a guide for good living and gives us a trustworthy direction to heaven, neither of those functions is the one thing, the true purpose. 